Hi, my name is Lamont Dean, and this presentation is being given to review our second Long Range Facility Planning Committee meeting that occurred on October 19th at 6 p.m. We first gave an overview of the agenda, was to review meeting number one, to discuss our demographic survey report, to review web page information as well as resources that we provided to develop guiding principles through work groups of our long range facility planning committee. We reviewed meeting number one that occurred on October 5th. We discussed the educational vision, the facilities assessment and the financial report. This information can be found by clicking on our long range facility planning website and reviewing meeting one content. Next, we heard our demography report for the growth of population in and around Smith County that includes Chapel Hill ISD. The demography report can be found in this presentation. I will play it in its entirety. Well, good evening, Bob Templeton here. Can you see my screen okay? Tonight, I will share just the um, summary, the highlights of the demographic study that we've just recently completed. Uh, no doubt, these are very interesting and unusual times. The pandemic has continued to have an impact on the enrollment across the country and across the state of Texas. We work with about 100 school districts each year, and this year specifically, we're seeing some uh, very unusual patterns. Um, when I look at your enrollment history, for this fall, we're showing that your enrollment um, is pretty flat compared to last year. The enrollment from a couple of weeks ago was about 3,421 students, which is about the same as it was a year ago. The yellow cells are the largest grade per year, and the green cells on that top spreadsheet are the second largest classes. So you can see there's a pattern where the current ninth grade class is the largest class. Now the ninth grade is typically a larger class and the second largest class right now is the 10th grade. And so you can see for the last several years, this year's 10th grade class has been one of the largest classes and there's definitely a, a wave of larger class sizes that are working their way through and are right now, your largest two grades are both in the high schools. Now, I know that this year's enrollment is still being slightly impacted by the pandemic due to those younger elementary grades are still a little bit below what we would normally see for your school district. That pre-K class number is about the same as it was last year. And what we're seeing across the state is it is still those younger grade levels, those elementary grades, where those parents are still a little bit concerned about the pandemic and we're seeing some hesitancy for those families to enroll their kids in school. Now, when we look at the economic conditions across the Tyler region, this is the unemployment rate for the Tyler MSA, which is the purple line, and the turquoise line in the is the state of Texas unemployment rate. You can see back in March of 2020, when the pandemic started, the unemployment rate shot up like we've never seen before to over 13% for the state of Texas. And the Tyler MSA's unemployment rate has had a similar pattern, but it is a little bit better in Tyler than what we're seeing across the state of Texas. Now, some of the overall demographic trends for the Chapel Hill School District, the total population as of the 2020 census is right at 22,598 which is up about 6% from the 2010 census. So the area is growing. The five to 19 age population, which is roughly the school age population, seen a little bit of an increase at about 4,892, which is up about 1.4% from the 2010 census. Now this is helpful data because it does give us a pretty good idea of how much of the school age population that you are capturing within your school district. And right now, when we compare your enrollment from 2010 and the enrollment from 2020, 
you're capturing roughly about 70% of the school age kids in your school district. The median household income is up about 57%, huge jump there. And the number of households, total households within the district has grown about 15%. Now, home sales have been very surprising during the pandemic. Home sales have actually been very, very strong. And this is looking at deed transaction data for your school district going all the way back to 2010. You can see you're selling, you have about 350 to 400 total home sales per year. A majority of that is for existing home sales. Your new homes are estimated to be at about anywhere from 22 to 30 home, new homes per year are being built in the district. Now the average price is going up significantly. We're seeing this increase all across the state. Back in 2010, the average price for a new home was 207,000. Year to date in 2020, the average price for a new home in Chapel Hill ISD is getting close to $400,000. But this inflation in the cost is being attributed to the cost of materials. It's a shortage of labor, and it's also a shortage of supply, which is causing the overall prices to go up for both existing homes and for new homes. Now, looking at, uh, this is kind of a zoomed in picture of the district. The green shaded areas are the areas within the district that we are seeing some significant new home construction. This is the uh, Cottage Park, the Chapel Wood subdivisions. Those are the two areas that are in green. There's roughly about 60 available lots for builders to build on today. And there's about 250 future lots in the land that's owned in those surrounding areas right around those active areas where they are currently building. Now the turquoise shaded area and the purple shaded area, those are some multifamily projects that are uh, triplexes. And so there's some multifamily that are under construction there. And that represents about a hundred future multifamily units, which is those triplex uh, type development that's in the, um, it's called Huntington Towers, which is that area just to the, the south of the green shaded area. And all of this activity is in the Wise Elementary Attendance Zone. Now we geocoded your students so that we could see where your students are living. We do this to get a, a yield of students per home. And what you'll notice is those dots actually represent your students geocoded to their addresses. We've also kind of color coded the city limits of the Tyler. That's that uh, turquoise area that's in the western edge of the di district. So that area is in the, the city limits of Tyler. And then we've also got this kind of rectangle shaped area. That's the city limits for the new Chapel Hill uh, city limits. But overall, you've got about 170 students that live outside of the district that are transferring in. That represents about 6% of the student population. About 12.6% of your students live within the uh, city limits of Tyler in that uh, turquoise shaded area. And then you've got about a 2% of your population that live in the city limits of Chapel Hill. So you'll notice a majority of your students live in the unincorporated areas that are scattered throughout your school district. You can see we've got a high concentration of students that live in this kind of northwest section, which is in the Jackson Elementary Attendant Zone. Now, I mentioned this earlier, we did some comparisons of your student enrollment to the school age population in 2010. The enrollment was 3,340, and the school age population in 2010 was 4,822 which is about a 70% ratio of your students to the school age population. We did the same thing in 2021. We looked at the estimate for the school age population, that five to 19 population, which is about 4,892. The enrollment in 2021 was 3,421. Once again, it's about a 70% capture rate of your school age kids that are in your school district. 
Now we work with about a hundred school districts across the Texas. Now keep in mind, no school district captures a hundred percent of the school age population. So there is always a section that is either going to private school, charter school, or homeschool. So those are the three other areas that we'll see kids that'll be attending that are not attending the local public school. For most of our clients, about 80% to 85% is kind of the maximum capture rate. So it looks like you've got room for about a 10% gain. And keep in mind for every 5% that you increase that uh, capture rate of that ratio roughly translates to about an additional 248 students. Now here's the first look at the enrollment projections. I did two series of projections. One is what I'm calling a mid-level projection, which is uh, building, you know, that future single family. It's also assuming that you um, have a very similar elementary ratio and a very similar kindergarten ratio than what you've experienced the last few years. So there's a little bit of a bounce back for enrollment for next year which would have your enrollment getting to 3,463. Now you'll notice in the 23, 24 year, the enrollment declines. That's because we're graduating a fairly large uh, senior class and our kindergarten class is about the same. So we're, we basically have a wash between the senior class and the kindergarten class. So a little bit of a drop in the um, overall enrollment, but then you'll notice over time, over that five-year period, your enrollment gets to 3,451. And in 10 years, the enrollment could be at 3,596. Now, here's what these projections look like at the campus level. You'll notice that Wise Elementary, it does have some housing growth. So we are growing the Wise Elementary zone. It's going to get very close to its capacity in that um 2024 actually it exceeds capacity in 2024 and stays near 700 students and then in 27 it continues to grow and could ultimately get to about 749 about 758 students in 10 years jackson elementary stays just above 400 students for the foreseeable future could get as high as about 453 students in that nine to ten year period your intermediate school stays in that 750 range, near 750. And then in 2026 and in 2027, it starts to grow. We've still got plenty of capacity at the intermediate school. At your junior high, it's currently at about 528 students. And it's going to drop with some larger class sizes that are going through. And then it's going to get back to about 520 in five, four to five years your high school, it's going to continue to grow for the next couple of years. Then it'll stabilize a little bit as those larger class sizes leave. So your current large ninth grade and your larger 10th grade class in a few years, that's what's causing your overall high school number to settle in at just over 1,000 to 1,032 students. Now, I created a second model of forecast, which has a little bit more aggressive capture rate and it also increases that kindergarten ratio just a little bit you'll notice that with this model we still have that little bit of a drop in the 23 24 year but next year's number could jump to about 3516 students and then in six years we could get excuse me in five years we could get to 3595 students which is you know about 170 student growth over the five-year period. And then in 10 years, your enrollment could get to about 3,801 students. Now, here's what this forecast looks like at the campus level. Under this model, Wise Elementary would exceed capacity next year. It'll stay above capacity. The Jackson grows just a little bit, but it still stays, you know, below 500 for the foreseeable future. You can see the intermediate gets to closer to 800 in about five years. Your junior high, a little bit above 500 in five years. And your high school gets close to 1,100 students in 2027. 
and just it stays just above 1,100 students through this 10-year period. Now, keep in mind, if you um, capture a little few more students, I think there's a little bit of room to capture more students for it. Every one to two percent increase, that's about 100 to 125 students. A five percent change in the capture rate could reduce, could produce an additional 250 students. But overall, we expect your numbers in five years could be between 3,451, could get as high as almost 3,600 in five years with a little bit more um, um, increase in some. Um, marketing and with some increase in capture rate and in 10 years could get as high as about 3,800 students. The pandemic did impact enrollment this year and last year it actually caused a drop of about 100 to 120 students over the last two years. There is a steady supply of new housing in the Wise Elementary Zone. We expect it could produce between 20 to 30 new homes per year for the next five to seven years. Chapel Hill ISD is currently serving about 70% of the school age population in the district. And as I mentioned, about a 5% increase in that capture rate could produce an additional 250 students. Over the next five years, the district's enrollment is likely to fall between 3,450 and about 3,600 students. And it's the Wise Elementary that is going to be the fullest and experience the most uh, enrollment growth between your campuses. Next, we reminded our Long Range Facility Planning Committee about the purpose of the committee. We reminded them that the Facilities Committee has been developed to create a community-based comprehensive prioritized list of facility needs that addresses projected improvements of existing facilities while strategically planning for long-range facility programs. Who can be included in the committee? Any citizen, taxpayer, stakeholder, or parent with a vested interest in Chapel Hill ISD and our community is invited to be a part of this committee. All of our community, we welcome you at any of our meetings. In addition, we gave an overview of future meetings that will occur. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday, November the 2nd at 6 p.m in the Jackson Elementary Cafeteria. The meeting to follow on Tuesday, November 16th, 6 p.m. in the Wise Cafeteria. The meeting after that, November 18th at 6 p.m. in the Kissam Intermediate Cafeteria. The next meeting will be on December 7th, at 6 p.m. back at the Junior High Cafeteria. And the last meeting will be on Thursday, December 9th at 6 p.m. at Central Office. Next, we discuss the goals of the Long Range Facility Planning Committee. Our goal is to create a master plan that is good for 10 to 15 years that will align with the educational vision and the facility needs of Chapel Hill ISD. Next, we discussed our visioning statement, which our visioning statement is defined as a statement that will give us a forward-looking, motivational, inspiring, reflective evaluation of what we desire for our community. On Tuesday, October 5th, the Long Range Facility Planning Committee began the work of developing a visioning statement. Rough draft visioning statement number one, 21st century facilities that are designed for an innovative and diverse learning environment that will enrich student learning promote the overall health of the whole child, and foster a sense of pride among our students, staff, and community. Visiting statement number two, to host our students in updated and modernized state-of-the-art facilities that allows our district to be sustainable, flexible, and academically distinguished in East Texas while preparing our students to be competitive with necessary life skills and academics that invest back into the local community. Our committee continued the work at our last meeting with the goal to have one visioning statement. 21st century facilities 
that are designed for an innovative and diverse learning environment that will enrich student learning, promote the overall health of the whole child, and foster a sense of pride amongst our stakeholders while preparing our students to become competitive with the necessary skills and academics to invest back into the local community. Lastly, the committee developed its guiding principles. Guiding principles are the overarching big picture concepts to guide our decision making. I deal with philosophies and standard approaches to common themes, and it's more like a constitution versus a statute. Uh, we gave the committee examples of guiding principles, which is promote educational excellence, enhance facilities, upgrade safety and security, update technology infrastructure, and to maximize student opportunities. We gave them examples of guiding principles. An example might be to provide for safety, security, and accessibility, provide adequate space for all programs, and to provide 21st century facilities. We then went through a process of brainstorming in small groups with the Long Range Facility Committee. We prioritized the groups by constituents, which all the elementary groups were together, the middle grades, which is Kiss Sam and Junior High, were together, the high school group was together, as well as a external community group to evaluate the overall process. We did nominations by constituent groups and gave each committee member an opportunity to vote on what they felt was their top three priorities. The guiding principle was drafted on October 19th. We will update those on November the 2nd, but wanted to give our community an opportunity to see some of the guiding principles based on our long range facility planning committee to provide flexibility and adaptability for the academies of Chapel Hill to grow, safety and security of the district, facilities that serve multiple purposes, and equity for all. Again, we thank you for your participation and your commitment to Chapel Hill ISD.